Good morning. Uh, great to have you all here, and uh, the great I am, boy, what a, well, the powerful names of God, and we look at the different names of God, and the significance of those names, and, and uh, the, the great I am pretty much sums it all up, that he is the, the author and finisher of our faith, he is the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all things, he holds all things together, uh, he gives life, he takes life, and uh, just want to ask you to pray for the Promsma family, the Hoskins. Um, her uh, Cherry's grandmother went home to be with the Lord last night, and um, many of you, amen, yeah. She's, uh, we're applauding because she's with the Lord, and she's not suffering anymore, and so uh, we're thankful for that. Um, uh, wonderful woman, a very gracious woman, very kind-hearted and uh, so just to pray for the family in the days ahead and for Martin as, you know, losing someone you've been married to for so many years. They both came. <clears throat> <clears throat> anyway, great people. So let's, uh, let's just pray. Father, we're thankful that you are the great I am. And uh, you are Jehovah Jireh. You provide, you, you give us peace and strength. You are the author of our salvation, the finisher of our lives. And Father, it's so good to know that you have a place for us when we leave this earth that's far beyond anything that our eyes or minds or ears, anything that we, we can't even comprehend what it's like to be in your presence. You've told us that no, nobody could see you and live uh, in your glory and splendor. And as Isaiah said that he was just undone at seeing your afterpart, the train of your glory, he was undone. We thank you that you are a, <clears throat> a God who heals our hearts and lifts our hearts and, and carries us through times of, of loss. And even though we say we lose a person and seeing them, Lord, we know exactly where they are when they know you, Lord, what a, what a joy that is. So we ask you bless our time together this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, and uh, Counted Worthy is the title of the sermon today, Counted Worthy, and, and boy, it's so wonderful when we look at the truth of the Word of God that he sees us as being worthy of being in his presence, that we are worthy to know him, we who were sinners, who we were separated from him, destined for eternity in hell, and uh, he reached out to us and extended his grace and mercy to us. And while we were yet sinners, he saved us and sent his son on a rescue mission to search and rescue us. What a great God we have. But we're counted worthy. Um, in Acts uh, 5.41, the apostles, this is written down, recorded for us. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering, disgrace, for the name of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? They were persecuted. They were, they, were, they were abused for the name of Jesus Christ. And how wonderful is it to, um, to use and to know the name of Jesus Christ and to use his name in prayer that all authority and power have been given to Christ. And so as we come to him in our prayers with whatever it may be, he hears us and cares for us. Um, counted worthy by God's grace because of what Christ has accomplished for us. In other words, we're loved no matter what. We're loved unconditionally no matter what. Isn't that great? You look in the mirror sometimes and you think, well, am, I, am I worth being loved? Am I, am I lovable? And there are people in our world today all around us who are wondering, am I lovable? How, who could love me? And God loves us. He loves us unconditionally, there's nothing that we can do when we come to know him and put our trust in him, the work of Calvary. There's nothing that can separate us ever from that. Isn't that great? Those are truths you can, you can live with. You can die with those truths. How wonderful is that? Love no matter what. We'll never be abandoned. It's Jesus said, I'll never leave you, forsake you. And so that's kind of the lead in my introduction to being counted worthy this morning. First point, verse 1. We thank God for you, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, the writing to the Thessalonians, and they're saying, we thank God for you, for your testimony. To the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you 
from the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so because, <clears throat> because your faith is growing more and more and love every one of you has for each other is increasing. So in the midst of difficulties in life and in persecutions and struggles at the things that the, between the Jews and the Gentiles and all that was going on in Thessalonica, they were, they were distressed. They were going through difficult times. And, and Paul is, and they're saying, we're so proud of you that your faith is growing, your love for each other is growing. Persecution and struggles and difficulties bring people to a place that nothing else can. We've all found that to be true in our lives, haven't we? That, that when we go through these difficulties and trials and struggles in life, God shows up in a way that when everything's going great, it just seems like he's kind of out there. We don't really need him until we come to those places. And so then through the body of Christ, us loving each other and praying for each other and encouraging each other, we see the true love of God, the hands and the feet of Christ manifested through the body of Christ. And that's what they were experiencing. And it truly is the greatest place to be when you're in those uh, places of difficulty. <clears throat> Perseverance and relief, verse 4. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All of this is evident that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. You know, when, when we look at disciplines of life, being an education, uh, desiring a degree, furthering our education, maybe it's sports, athletics, being counted worthy to be on the Olympic team, uh, the national team, or on uh, uh, professional football, or, or whatever it is, or whatever your discipline is, to be counted worthy to say that you've made it, you're qualified, you're in. Wow, what a feeling that is. What, what a great sense that is. And so to be part of the body of Christ and to be counted worthy to be counted and called a child of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ, is has got to be one of the greatest joys there is for us. And sometimes we maybe forget the significance of that, but it make, makes all the difference in the world. And so as Paul was saying here, that they were counted worthy of the kingdom of God, being counted worthy of the kingdom of God. We're all, our destination is fixed. We have the ticket. We have the place reserved for us for that place of, of, and point of departure in this life to be with him for eternity. How great is that? To know that you are secure in Christ. To know that there's no one who can pluck you out of the hand of God. To know that there is a place in heaven for you. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Can I get an amen? Amen. Bill told me this morning, he said, you ought to go for the amen once in a while. So thank you, Bill. But, but you know, truly, all these things, this, this tidal wave, this tsunami of truth, these, these overwhelming places and waves of grace that come over us in this life in the times of despair are there that when he said we're counted worthy of the kingdom of God. We're not worthy in ourselves. I'm, I'll speak for myself. I'm not worthy but he counts me worthy, not because of my righteousness, not because of my works, they're filthy rags, but because of what he has done on our behalf and because I've simply deposited my trust in the work of Calvary. Wow. Counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. They were suffering. And so to bring it back to the reality of that, you know what? All these things you're going through are working and doing something in transforming your life. And, and as you're going through these struggles of life, we understand that we haven't gotten home yet. We have not arrived yet. We're on this journey, and what a journey it is. Verse 6, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give you relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. What's so great here is, is Paul is setting the stage here to help clarify some doctrinal teaching that was inaccurate. Uh, there, there was uh, a circulation that, that the people in Thessalonica, 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 that's a different town, you know, that's, anyway, you know, it's close, but anyway, but, it, but, but the problem was that they thought that the rapture had taken place, and so 
they were going through all this suffering and persecution, and they thought, you know, the second coming had taken, you know, that Jesus had, the rapture had happened. They're gone, and now they're, they're going through this persecution. And so that you can imagine, they were scared. They were thinking, gee, maybe I'm not a believer. Maybe I really, this isn't, maybe my faith wasn't enough. And so there was this struggle that they were having here because of the false teaching that was going on. And so Paul is laying the platform and the stage here for them to understand that the God of mercy and grace had not abandoned them, had not left them uh, for judgment and discipline. So he is talking about these concepts here, which are very important. And then he goes on to say, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Okay, he's talking about now the second coming. He's talking about the end of the, tribula- uh, the, end of the tribulation, um, before the millennial kingdom, and all these things that are going to take place. And this is a picture of Jesus. We like to think of meek and mild Jesus, you know, who had the children on his lap and feeding the multitudes and out fishing with the boys, having a good time. Here's, here's a different Jesus that we see presented to us. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, now get this, in blazing fire with his powerful angels. It's a whole different Jesus, isn't it? I mean, see, we, we tend to think of you know, Jesus as meek and mild and lowly, and you know, they dragged him off and crucified him and tortured him and, and did all these things to him. And he was the, the prince of peace and the king of kings and lord of lords. And, and he went through all this. But when he comes back to deal with the sin of the world, to finally put the final ending in place of dealing with all the sin of mankind, and, and it all comes to a head here. It said that Jesus is going to come from heaven in blazing fire. So, you know, sometimes, like I said, we tend to look at Jesus this way, but he is, he's coming back now, and he's in charge, and he's going to deal with all the things. And see, people think that they're going to get through life, and they get through this life, or there's these atrocities that we see going on in the world around us even now, and nobody's going to get away with anything. God is a just God. He's a perfect, holy, just God. God's justice will be served, and Jesus will be serving justice for all of those who've rejected him, choose to reject him, willingly reject him, and mock him, and, uh, and, and deny the truth. Discipline is coming. And then he says here, with his powerful angels. There are many fallen angels that we call demons. There's demonic entities and demonic oppression. Some of you have been exposed to those things. Some of you have been in those situations. Maybe some of you have run into people who are demon-possessed. Um, <clears throat> I have a good friend who lives in Ohio who was possessed for many years, third generation of possession. And God finally freed him from that. And so it's pretty interesting to, to find the history. But there's real demonic fallen angels who influence the world around us, but there are also his holy angels who will be coming with Jesus to be involved in this aspect of serving justice. So um, there's the evil, the good and the evil, the right and the wrong. Every movie that's ever been made between the guys with the white hats and the black hats are all pictures of, of the biblical battle. The good guys, the bad guys. You know, every, every movie storyline is the same. There's the good guys and there's the bad guys. And by God's grace, the guys with the white hats always win, right? That's right. Well, God, God is the, the king of light, the father of all light, and tr- again, truth will be served, justice will be served. Verse 8, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the people who've been persecuted for their faith, the people who today are standing for the truth and trying to do what is right, um, God is God's going to deal with this. And so then he goes on to say here in verse 9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people. number of things here that are just absolutely mind-boggling when we look at this. Verse 9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. Wow, that's some powerful statements. Statements that we say these words and we can't even begin to comprehend it. But when he talks about punished with everlasting destruction, you see, hell is forever. Heaven is forever. Hell is forever. Separation from God is forever. It's eternity. It's eternal. 
It, it's going to go on forever. And then he says here, everlasting destruction. I mean, they're going to be an everlasting destruction. It's the complete opposite. Everything that you can possi possibly comprehend about what is good and what heaven might be, it's going to be the complete opposite for these people who choose to reject God. And, uh, and when, when you see the term here, they will be shut out. They will be shut out from the presence of the Lord. Can you imagine? See, everything that you know, good or bad, is, is a revelation from God. And here's the thing, to be shut out, even as evil as evil is, to be shut out, can you imagine a world where there's no light, there's no life, there's no joy, there's no peace, there's suffering, there's agony, there's torment, Everything, everything that you and I, the chairs, the metal of the chairs and the fabric that you're sitting in this building, you're, this carcass you're dragging around, everything will be, you will be shut off from the presence of God. See, we're created in the image of God. So take that away. Take away sunlight. Take away cold, uh, the wind, fragrances, food, taste, scent, smell. Totally shut out from the presence of God. Talk about hell. See, we can't even comprehend it. You, we can't even begin to comprehend it because ever, some, from the day you were born, while you were even in your mother's womb, you were in the presence of God. We're created, in, we're in the presence of God. So to be completely shut out, what a horrible, horrid thing. I mean, that, that should make us shake in our boots. That, sh that should give us a sense of, of, of need for those who are perishing and going to a Christless eternity where they will be shut out. We're talking about family members. We're talking about friends. We're talking about neighbors. They will be shut out. We won't. We got it. We got our ticket. We got our pass. The golden ticket. But when I read this and I read this, man, it just wells up within my soul a sense of urgency and a, and a, and a sense that, that the good news, people need to hear the good news. I, I said at a funeral last week, I think we've been, sometimes we've been saved too long. Okay, and what I mean by that is the joy and the, the, the excitement of knowing Christ and making him known isn't really a big deal anymore. We can fall into that trap. We can fall into that trap where it's, yeah, yeah, I'm going to heaven and everything's great and I love Jesus, I go to church, I read my Bible, everything's wonderful. But, but folks, we are living in a day and age where we are seeing the closing of time. We're seeing the fact that there are people, family members, friends, who will be shut out. Now, I'm not trying to manipulate you by guilt. I'm just saying I believe for the freedoms we have in this country, we have a responsibility to be proclaimers of the good news of Jesus Christ, wherever, whenever, however. That's important. And if, we've, if we lose that sensitivity, God help us. God help us. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. And, and get this, the majesty of his power. The majesty of his power. Wasn't it great the last few days you wake up and the sun is out and it's warm and you can go outside without a, a jacket on and you can enjoy the weather and the trees are blooming and, and that. And it's, but, but the majesty of his power, isn't that a statement? Think about that. Just meditate on it. The majesty of his power. Who's making your heart beat right now? The ability, these two things in our head, in these eye sockets, that we're able to see color and sense color and distance. Some of us can see better than others, right? But, but this, the ability to see, isn't that amazing? The ability to hear, to smell, to taste, that's all part of the majesty of, of God's creation in which he has put and set eternity in us. We are created beings that have a purpose and, have a pl and God has a plan for our lives that's unfolding as we sit here even today. But the majesty of his power, how incredible is that? If you've, have you ever been in a really, some of the storms, you watch some of the storms that have been moving through these tornadoes, and you see how they're just able to, in a second's, destroy everything that you've worked for your whole life can be gone in a second. Your life can be gone in a second. The majesty of his power. So when we put this all together, there should be a sense of awe of who God is and a sense of awe with the reality of the privilege and the opportunities we have to live the lives that God has given us. 
I know probably everyone in this room has got something that they're dealing with this morning. Everybody here has got something they're dealing with in their lives. Every one of us. But God has given you the gift of today. Is the furnace running right now? Whew. Why are we talking about hell? So, <laughs> you know, crank it up. Yeah. I saw a sign in front of a little church in Racine one time. It was the summer and it was really hot out. And the sign said, if you think it's hotter than hell, it isn't. That was the title of the sermon, you know. So, well, it isn't that hot. But anyway, okay, that was perfect timing. Anyway, the majesty of his power. On the day he comes to be glorified in his people. You see, there's something about the fact that God is, God is glorified in and through us. We are worshipers. He's created us to worship him and to live for him. And so when we're going about living our lives, and thank you for dealing with the heat, Aaron. Um, but you know what I mean? It's like all these things are so miraculous. And then he goes on to say, and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. And this includes you. Isn't that great? So Paul is writing this letter saying, hey, look, don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. You're going through difficult times, but God has a big picture, and God's going to get you through this. And, and he hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't left you behind. But he said, he's telling him, this includes you, all these truths and all these principles of the future and the hope that we have. Boy, when you remove hope from a person's life, what do you have? Oh, man, life is miserable when we lose hope. Have you ever been there where you've kind of lost hope in a situation? Well, that's a tough place to be. But the God of hope, who lives within us in the person of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the God of hope, he's saying this includes you. And he says to be marveled at. And the word marveled here is to be filled with wonder, astonishment. So we, we're, 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 we marvel at the fact that God has chosen us to, to live with him, to be, to be with him in eternity. And we're going to have jobs in heaven. We're not all going to play harps and eat the angel food cake. You know, I, I don't, it might disappoint some of you. I know Dave was looking forward to playing the harp. But, but the reality is, is that God has got all this in store for us, and it's beyond anything we can comprehend. And it is absolutely wonderful to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony to you the pure gospel, the good news. And see, that's what happens when, when you take a person who's in darkness, who doesn't know God, who's dead spiritually, and they become born again or born from above, and they, they now are, are, their spirits have been quickened, have been made alive, because we're all born into the world dead spiritually. In Adam, we're in the first Adam, we're all born dead spiritually. And then, so then we have the spiritual rebirth from above. It's supernatural. God saves us. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He transforms our minds in the twinkling of an eye. It was amazing how when God got a hold of me, how I went from Captain Insano to, to who I am today, when some of you may be still wondering. <laughs> okay, all right. That's probably not a good example. Okay. Yes. So, anyway, you can pray for us. We, we as a staff are going to Chicago this week to Moody Pastors Conference. So, um, if you have any questions, call Dave Yingling. He said he'd be, hand, he'd be glad to handle it, and that's why he's going to get a harp. <laughs> but anyway, we're looking forward to that. But, but you know, so, so the, the change in our lives is incredible. How when God gives, when your spiritual eyes open, and now you, you know, you read the scriptures. Remember when you first got saved, you'd read the scriptures, and you're like, oh, wow, this is awesome. As a kid growing up, I was told that I couldn't read the Bible and understand it in the church I was in. I only like the pastor could, but I was dead from the neck up, and that's true. I couldn't read and understand the Bible. I got saved. I started reading the Bible, and I was like, whoa, I get this. I understand it now. Because the, the scriptures say the natural man can't understand the truth of the Word of God. You need the Holy Spirit to understand the truth. What a gift that is, isn't it? How are you doing with all that? It's awesome, isn't it? It's awesome to be able to read the Word and to have it make sense and understand that God is talking to you. Do you ever read the Bible and you feel like God is talking to you? Isn't that great? You open the scripture and it's like, that's my name. He's talking about me here. Isn't that great? And that's going back to the beginning of time, book of Genesis to Revelation. We're in there. We're in there. We're in the Lamb's book of life. And so when we read the scriptures, they come alive to us. And as they come alive to us, we realize that God is talking to us and he cares about us 
And when we're in those deep, deep times of despair, you can hear, it's like you almost can hear the voice of God, that he's talking to you and he cares about you. And you feel like, you know, <clears throat> when I was a little kid, I used to walk with my dad, you know, and it's like, you know, be walking around with your dad somewhere. That's what God's doing with us right now. He, he takes you by the hand and he's walking around with you no matter what. He's got your hand no matter what. And you may feel despair at times. You may feel hopeless at times. But he said, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here always for you. What a gift. What a God. Anyway, got to get this thing on the ground here. Third point, in Christ alone. In Christ alone. Verse 11, this, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may fulfill. And get this, I love this. I, I, I'm getting excited, I gotta slow down here. Okay, verse 11. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling. The word worthy here is the idea of made righteous. We have been made right with God. And because we have been made right with God, because we weren't right with God, now we are right with God, he is, he is calling us and calling us worthy, and he's giving us something to do. You know, like, I'm not talking about busy work. Remember in school and the teachers, you ran at the, end, at the end of the assignment if you had your work done, which never happened for me. But they give you busy work to do, you know, like, just do something. Look, do definitions. They'd send me down the hall with my desk, and I'd have to do definitions all day long, because it was better to have me out of the classroom. Busy work. Well, and that's not busy work. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his, now again, again, his power, not your power, by his power, he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. Isn't that great? That God counts you worthy not only to save you and separate you and sanctify you and work in your life and develop you through your life, but he has things th for us to do in this world that are given to us by him. What a gift that is. Isn't that great? To know that everyone here has a purpose and every one of you here has value because the world is telling us you don't have value and that's why everybody's shooting and killing each other nowadays and children are being shot when they're in their house and their bed sleeping at night. Every one of us has value. Every one of us has purpose. No matter how, what grade you graduated from school, no matter what your skill level is, no matter what you do for a living, everyone here has value. Everyone here has purpose. Every one of you here is an instrument of the righteousness and the holiness of God being lived out through you through the person of the Holy Spirit. And so he gives you supernatural things to do with the supernatural Holy Spirit that only God can do in and through you. And you know what? We only have a few days left. You know that? We only have a few days left. None of us knows what tomorrow is going to bring. What a, what a great truth that is. And he goes, fulfill every good purpose. God wants us to fulfill his purpose, but he's giving us purpose, and he wants us to fulfill that purpose in every act prompted by your faith. And so what, it comes, what that ultimately means is everything that I have the ability to do comes from an overflow of my relationship and my walk with the living God. It isn't my strength. It isn't my ability it isn't my capacity, it is in him and through him. Life-changing truth. I was on my knees with uh, Charity's grandma and grandpa. I was on my knees, and I had my arm on Anna, and I had my arm on Martin, and Martin had his arm around my hand, his hand around my neck. I was on my knees praying for her that God would just take her. And you know what, at that moment, it was, it was sacred. You know what I'm talking about? In those moments when life is passing and that you're at the end of your life and Martin was, was reassuring Anna about heaven and talking to her about being with the Lord and, oh boy, and during those moments, those are sacred privileges we have, ladies and gentlemen. Monday, I was at the cemetery with the remains of Lois Folkman, and we were committing her remains to the Lord. And these are people I've known forever. And, you know, I can't wait for this to be over sometimes, watching people fade away and die. It's not much fun, is it? 
but yet it's sacred. We're all going to get there one way or another. But what a privilege to know Jesus Christ and to worship the true God of the universe and to know that these people are in the presence of the living God. Not maybe, not wishful thinking, and we base that on the word of God. The truth of the script, the spoken word of God, the inspired word of God. So all these things we get to do, ladies and gentlemen, while we're here for this short time, are sacred acts of worship. We're created to be worshipers. And so whatever God has you doing in your life tomorrow, this afternoon, enjoy the journey. Verse 12, we pray this so that the name, and this is the key, we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, in him, in you, in him, in Christ, according to the grace. Grace is the most abused word probably in our culture today. We, t- we talk about grace and we don't know what we're talking about. But when we understand the grace of God that while you were a sinner, while you were a God-hater, a blasphemer, God had sent his son a couple thousand years ago to die for you so that you could have a life of meaning and purpose. Not just drifting through life waiting for retirement or waiting for tomorrow or that next big thing, but he gave you this tremendous gift. The grace of our Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're counted worthy, ladies and gentlemen. We are counted worthy, not by anything we have done, The Ephesians says it's not by our works. It's not by anything we have done. It's all that he has done for us. And all we simply need to do is come to realize we're sinners. We've been born into the world dead spiritually. We need to know of the God, the one and only true God worth living for, worth dying for. And that Jesus died for you and he rose from the dead, took your place, and he gave you the privilege of adult sons with full of grace and mercy, adopted into God's family, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Wow, what grace, what wonder. Let's close. Father, thank you for saving us. Thank you for empowering us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this day you've given us that we've been made right because of Jesus, not by, not by our filthy works, but by the work of Christ the finished work of Calvary, he died once for the sins of the world, the past, the present, the future. He died once and for all, the perfect lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. So Lord, we can live these lives and enjoy our happy dance. Amen.